Okay, now we've installed IIS. We've used the web platform installer to add some additional components. Let's get into IIS Manager and, and set up some websites. So I'm going to open up IIS Manager. And over here on the left-hand side, we see we have application pools, which we'll talk about later, and sites. So out of the box, we have the default website. I'm just going to delete that. It's, it's not useful for us. There's nothing special about it. So I'm just going to delete the, remove the default website. And I'm going to create a couple additional sites. So the first one I'm going to create is called site1.com. Uh, purely arbitrary, it's just for demonstration purposes. So I'm going to right click on sites, select add website, and I'm going to have to fill out this screen. The first piece of information it's going to ask me for is what is the site name. This is purely, I'm, I'm the only person that's ever going to see this, but let's, let's create it something that you know, is, is easy to remember. So I always like to name it the exact same thing that the users will go to my website as. So I'm going to call it site1.com. We see as we did that, it created an application pool called site1.com. Again, we'll talk about application pools later. And then I need to define where is the, the website physically stored. So I pre-created a folder at cinetpub slash site1.com. And you can see this is where the actual HTML or ASPX or PHP pages will be stored. So I provide that path, cinetpub site1.com. And now I have to define, um, specify the binding information. So this is, what happens is the request will come into IIS. And then IIS will, based off of this binding information, route the request to the appropriate site. So out of these three pieces of information, IP address, port, and host name, one of those has to be unique between all the other sites so that uh, IIS is able to determine which site the request could, should go to. So first off for IP address, we almost always leave this at all unassigned. What this means is which, you know, which, I, which IP address did the request come into. Web servers often have multiple IP addresses. We'll talk about... Um, where this comes into play is when we use an SSL certificate, and we'll talk about that later. But generally speaking, we leave this at all unassigned. Port 80 is the default for an HTTP site. So when in your web browser, when you type in site1.com, it automatically connects to the web server on port 80. We could change this to another arbitrary number, let's say 8080, but that would require the user to type in site1.com colon 8080. Obviously, this is something you never want to do, so consider um, the port number to not be a changeable number. We always want that to be port 80. So the last piece of information, the last piece of uh, unique information we can provide is the host name. What happens with the web browser is when it connects to the web server, one of the pieces of information it passes along is the host header or the host name. So if, if you went to site1.com, it's going to pass along site1.com. If you went to google.com, it's going to pass along google.com. So we're going to match on that piece of information. So our host name in this case is going to be site1.com. We'll click OK, and we now have a, uh, a website hosted in IIS. So I'm going to open up a web browser, navigate to site1.com, and we should see my beautiful website. Now a lot of times users um, habitually will type in www.site1.com. Now if we go to that page now, we're going to get a 404. What's happening here? is the request is coming into IIS and it's looking to bind um, against binding information from one of the sites. If we look at the, the bindings of the site, so if we go under edit, edit site, um, and then the bindings, we'll see that the host name is site1.com, whereas the web browser passed along www.site1.com. What we need to do is provide additional binding information. Obviously, we don't want to turn away those users that, that type in the www. So we're just going to add an additional binding. Um, provide the exact same information except for the host name we're going to type www.site1.com. We'll click close. We'll go back to our web browser. If we refresh this page, we see that now it, that request comes into IIS. It matches up on that binding information and, and it directs the request to the appropriate site. Okay, let's do this one more time by creating site2.com. So we're going to add a site. We're going to give it an easy name to remember, so site2.com in this case. We're going to provide the path that the website's going to be stored at. We're going to leave IP address at all in a sign. Port's going to remain at 80. And we're going to have a host name of site2.com. Then we're going to go to edit the bindings and add an additional binding for www.site2.com. Now if I pull up my web browser, I go to site2.com. I see my beautiful website. If I go to www.site2.com, we should see the same beautiful website.